you're learning something about the Earth from this trip. Uh, and Gordon Barnes, our CBS meteorologist, can perhaps, using yesterday's pictures of the Earth, Gordon, uh, tell us something about what we found out about the weather here on Earth from that. Well, first of all, Walter, we find out very candidly that we had a massive storm center over the northeastern states, number one. But more than that is the fact that we were able to see in one picture some 50% uh, of the Earth's atmosphere and, of course, the weather patterns as such. In fact, the pictures of Earth which we received yesterday clearly showed some of those weather patterns, not only over the Americas, but also over the Pacific Ocean. I can see Baja, California, and uh, the southwestern part of the United States. There's a big fog cloud bank going northeast. There was a lot of the Gulf of Mexico going up to the eastern part of the United States. And it appears now that the east coast is cloudy. I can see clouds over uh, parts of Mexico. The parts of Central America are clear. And we can also see the light bright spot of the uh, sub-solar point on the light side of the uh, Earth. Now, Roger, could you give us some idea about the colors, and also could you try a slight maneuver? It's disappearing, or we think about half of it. It's going off to our 12 o'clock. Okay, for colors, the waters are all a, sort of a royal blue. Clouds, of course, are uh, bright white. The reflection off the Earth is, uh, appears much greater than the moon. Uh, the land areas are generally a brownish, uh, sort of dark brownish uh, to light brown in, uh, texture. Many of the vortices of clouds can be seen of uh, various weather cells. And that long band of uh, appears serious uh, clouds that extend uh, from the entrance to the uh, Gulf of Mexico going straight out across the Atlantic. The Terminator, of course, cuts through the Atlantic Ocean right now, going from north to south. The southern Hemisphere is almost completely clouded over, and uh, up near the North Pole, there's quite a few clouds. South, uh, southwestern Texas and southwestern United States is clear. I'd say there's some clouds up in the northwest and over uh, in the uh, northeast portion. How's the definition on the, on the uh, picture? It looks pretty good. And it looks good here, too. Now we take the same uh, satellite, excuse me, we take the U.S. Weather Bureau satellite pictures that were taken some three or four hours before those were received from Apollo 8 yesterday on three separate passes, as the satellite is only 800 miles above the Earth compared to the 200,000-plus on Apollo 8. And you will notice that what we saw from Apollo 8 is confirmed by these pictures showing a cloud cover over the northeastern states, clear skies, of course, over the southwestern area, as well as Texas and another cloud area moving into the Pacific Northwest. And by the way, that cloudiness over the Pacific Northwest is starting to push through the Rockies this morning. And tomorrow afternoon, we'll begin to start spreading a light area of snow across the northern plains and Midwest and should reach here on the East Coast sometime very late tomorrow night or early on Thursday morning. But here at the CBS Space Weather Center in New York, the biggest problem with weather now is the recovery zone for Friday morning. As you can see, it is located south of Hawaii or and also just to the northwest of Christmas Island in that sort of egg-shaped area. Quite a concern, mainly because of the fact that right in that particular area now, we have what is known as the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone. Those of you who have had the opportunity to fly over the equator in an aircraft at some given time know that probably some of the worst turbulence you can experience is in thunderstorm activity over the equator. Mainly because of the fact the air is not moving too rapidly there. It's rising, being heated by the sun, picking up in an abundance of moisture from the, uh, from the oceans, and also dumping some of the heaviest rain and some of the highest clouds that you will see will be in that particular area. At this time, our forecast for recovery indicates that the winds will generally be 15 to 25 knots. Seas will be running some 10 to 14 feet high, and since the astronauts will be returning some 45 minutes prior to daylight, this, of course, is concern to everyone. And while talking about the convergence zone, 
I just want to go back to a conversation you and I had regarding Apollo 7. And maybe next time you go to Downey, we can ask Bill Stout the answer to this question that has been bothering me. Being a pilot and going through turbulence in a fixed-wing aircraft, naturally you have updrafts and downdrafts fasten your seat belt to prevent being jolted out of your seat. But what in the, when the Apollo capsule itself is descending through, we'll say, a thunderstorm cell and experiencing the updrafts and downdrafts, does it actually affect the craft itself? Do you happen to know? Well, I get to sounding like a, a, a space a technician myself when I get into this, but I would think it's a factor of the speed of the of the craft uh, uh, as opposed to the speed of the updraft or the turbulence and the speed uh, of the spacecraft coming in at 24,000 miles an hour uh, is such that uh, I doubt that an updraft would have very much effect. Well, except that when it gets down to uh well, say 30 or 40,000 feet, the speed is somewhat reduced at that point. Well, at that point, it's on parachutes. Right. So in, possibly in other words, could be some yeah, is there any slack or extra taut on the parachute on that updraft and downdraft? I don't know. It's We've, been bothering me. We can ask some people. Uh, um, wh one thing about your turbulent area for the landing on Friday morning, uh, Gordon, uh, that's, uh, you're talking about the conditions on Friday morning, that's a forecast of that, conditions? That, that's our forecast for the... Uh, How recovery. wide an area does that cover, do you know? Yes, it goes all the way up to about uh, 12 degrees north. As you can see here at uh, the dotted line, that is about the northernmost extreme area, which is approximately oh, 120 to 200 miles uh, north of where the planned recovery area is. How much downrange? Because they've, they've got 1,350 miles to play with without uh, very much difficulty. That is uh, from their... their prime target impact point, they can uh, skip slightly and by the control of the spacecraft uh, go down range a full 1,350 miles, which uh, should be enough to take them out of local weather conditions, shouldn't it? Uh, yes, if they go to the east a little farther, in other words, get outside of that dotted line closer towards the west coast, the uh, intertropical convergence zone is not as violent in that, in that particular area. Uh, for example, I would say maybe uh, six to seven hundred miles farther east than on that uh, egg-shaped area there. You know, if they decide at any time during these next seven orbits of the moon that they wish to change the landing spot on Earth, they can do that by firing off their engines at a different point around the moon. Uh, it seems that they, by the nature of orbital mechanics, they return to Earth uh, roughly uh, on a line down through the center of the moon, uh, drawn back to the center of Earth, uh, uh, they come back on that line. They fire off uh, their engine at the point where that line comes through the moon on the far side. And uh, by the nature of the orbital mechanics, that brings them back on that same line back to Earth. So they can change their landing zone, and they've got uh, other landing uh, recovery vessels scattered around the, the world, so they could come back at some other spot. In other words, you... Uh would assume that between now and the time that they do the uh, trans-Earth uh, uh, retro that uh, consideration, because I'm quite sure that uh, they uh, have the up-to-date weather information like we have here, and that the tropical convergence zone is not like a, a regular northeast. It doesn't move that fast. It may move 10 to 12 miles per day at times. Well, if they wanted to make that decision, they could. They could cut short the trip around the moon. They wouldn't lengthen it, I don't think, because they've got consumables aboard, which uh, are figured pretty close on this trip. Thank you, Gordon Barnes. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 8 will continue in a moment. Apollo 8 is on its third pass across the face of the moon on this extraordinary voyage of discovery. Borman, Lovell, and Anders are in good health, the spacecraft is working well, and apparently will be committed for the full 10 orbits as planned. With at 12.51 a.m., shortly after midnight on this Christmas Eve, uh, the firing of the uh, service propulsion engine to bring the astronauts back home. They will make seven more, ast uh, seven more circuits of the moon before they do that. In the next uh, five passes of the moon, they will be taking photographs and observing land features for man's landing on the moon, perhaps as early as next summer. 
There is one uh, positive uh, result already from the flight of Apollo 8, and we should report it to you, I think, to keep all of history recorded this morning. In London, Britain's Flat Earth Society admits now that it's going to have to take a new look at things. Our next CBS News Apollo 8 progress report will come on the midday news. We'll be on uh, later during the day, of course, with regular progress reports from the flight of Apollo 8, and there will be a special broadcast later tonight. We'll, of course, be reporting the uh, television transmission at 9.30 tonight, which will be the second and last uh, transmission from the moon, and we will be reporting also the uh, firing of the engines to return the astronauts to Earth. The next CBS News Apollo 8 progress report on the midday news. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News Space Center. This has been a CBS News special report, the flight of Apollo 8.